So, as I mentioned, I'm going to do some Q&A here where I'm going to answer your questions about anime and manga. We've already got a question in the chat room from, again, apologies if I'm mispronouncing this, Jod Singh, I believe. The question is, uh, increasing amounts of anime made today have an assumption that people are already aware of what constitutes the standard cliches. In essence, the audience is already aware of the meta of anime. And I'm going to take that to mean things like, you know, nosebleeds and angry throbbing forehead veins and stuff like that. Why is that done? Is it done because anime is more than a medium, uh, is more than a medium of storytelling? Has it become a culture of its own? And is it a crutch to make anime in such a manner? It's an excellent question. Um, yes, to <laughs> kind of uh, all of those. The issue is that anime has evolved. So if you look at anime of, say, the 60s and 70s, and even into the 80s, um, early anime was definitely aimed at a broad market. It was generally aimed at children. There was almost no anime aimed at even a teen audience, much less an adult audience, in the early days. And then an audience evolved and appeared for anime, particularly young adult men, you know, sort of high school, college age boys, young men. And that was good in that now there was a clear market for things. You know, you could actually make something and, and ask people what they wanted and give it to them instead of trying to hit everyone at once, which is very scattershot. The problem when you have a specific audience is that they will tell you they want certain things. If you give it to them, that, will, that creates a um, self-sustaining loop, and, but it, it creates a, a reinforcement loop where you tend to make the same things over and over. And that is certainly what's happened, is that anime has developed a lot of these cliches and these elements, even these character archetypes, the tsundere, for example. Uh, which we just recognize now, but let's be honest, it's a very strange character archetype. Somebody who cares for you, but doesn't want to admit it, and would, you know, would hate to even admit that she cares for you. That's the kind of thing that we just accept as part of an anime storyline, but as we deal with that, it becomes kind of difficult to deal with. Um, am I still going? I am still going. Yes, okay, sorry. A bit of a problem with the chat room, which is wonderful, always. Um, one second, as I try something. Um, let me try to restore chat. Um, and my chat has just disappeared, which is always fun, when I'm trying to do a live chat thing. So I'm hoping... Um, I can pop that back out, and I will still be um, alive and normal. Oh, I'm having an internet problem. Great! So, um, I have to pause this one second while I fix that. One moment. That's annoying. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Everything's fine, it's just a problem on my end. Okay, so I'll know to fix that moving forward. Alright, so we're back. Hmm. The issue whenever you're dealing with that is you do end up creating a, an insular environment, an insular audience. Um, so, on the one hand, that is a problem. On the other hand, it, it's worked. Anime continues to make money, they continue to make anime, and they're making more of it now than they have been recently. I don't, say, I don't want to say more than ever before, because that's really hard to judge, and depends on how many episodes are coming out in the given time, and all that kind of stuff. But, point being, we have a, you know, now compared to five years ago, there's certainly more anime being made. Which is, again, fine. Um, but it tends to be kind of samey for that reason. We are seeing some people break out of that because people understand this. You know, the, the staff behind anime realize you can't just make the same thing over and over. There has to be some 
creative explosion. And we're seeing that now with some of the science fiction series, some of the fantasy series. Fantasy certainly seems to be picking up steam in, um, in, the, anime, in the anime medium. So I do think that we're starting to make some progress there, which is good. Um, but yeah, it's, it is kind of a, a cause for concern. You, all, you are also seeing anime starting to move away a bit from those specific visual cliches. So there's, there are quite a few anime out there where you may see a sweat drop occasionally. You know, you may see, you, you rarely see a nosebleed these days in at least the shows I'm watching. Maybe that's self-selection. But those things seem to be um, less of a big deal than they used to be. So I think we are starting to, to, to realize there's a balance between all those things. Okay, uh, looking for more questions in the chat room. Until I see more of those, I'm going to move over to a um, set of questions from the internet. What got you interested in anime? That's an interesting question. Um, it's not what was my first anime. It's what got me interested in anime. Let me think about that for a second. Um, what got me interested in anime was the sci-fi channel, I think. Because the sci-fi channel used to show anime um, occasionally, back in the 90s. Like, we're talking mid-90s here. Uh, even the early 90s. Well, sci-fi channel came out in, like, 92, I think? Something like that? Anyway. And they would, they would run these festivals of anime, where they'd show, um, you know, anime for, like, a week in the summer. Um, or uh, at various times on the channel. And I was catching little bits of these things, and I was always a fan of animation. So seeing this, these very di this very different style of animation and stuff that was clearly aimed at an older audience, but also the sci-fi channel was showing these very sci-fi heavy stories, and that really appealed to me. So I got really excited by the idea of an animation medium that also had a lot of cool science fiction stories. And I think that's what really keyed me into the medium. Um, uh, another question. Um, if I want to introduce a story which happens to be anime to your parents or an older audience, recommendations there. So the obvious answer there is mm, Hayao Miyazaki. You know, uh, his movies are very easy for a non-anime fan to appreciate. Totoro, Kiki's Delivery Service, Porco Rosso. I think Porco Rosso is one of those films that works better for a, an adult audience in the sense that it's about you know, a middle-aged man who's kind of cynical. So people can relate to that a little bit better than stories about like young girls and things like that. Nothing against that, but uh, you know, again, when you're trying to get a, um, uh, an adult who doesn't understand anime into it, that perspective is, is a little, little easier to, to relate to. So I think that's a good one. Mamoru Hosoda's films, I think, work pretty well, too. Um, I recommend Wolf Children, except there is that scene where the werewolf, you know, sleeps with the girl, and it is a little weird. Um, but I think that is a, a good place to, a reasonable place to start if you know your parents aren't going to get freaked out by that. But Wolf Children is all about being a parent, and I think it's very relatable to parents. Other than that, um, you know, again, for TV series, it's hard. I think Cowboy Bebop is a really good um, intro to anime because it does have so many Western influences. So that's something you can show somebody who's not necessarily into anime but maybe curious. They'll latch on to that more Western storytelling, those more Western tropes, Western Hollywood tropes in Bebop. Uh, similarly, Trigun, because it's sort of a sci-fi Western I think that is a little easier for Americans to to grasp, but it is very anime, so um, that is an issue. Um, let's see here. Um, other anime for an older audience, I think, will work well for them. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to start there. On, I mean, ironically, a lot of the manga stories I think are better for adults, but it's harder, even harder, to get an adult into manga. You know, that kind of thing. Anyway, um, okay, but then it's a good question. So what if your, you know, your, your audience isn't um, uh, from the West? I don't know, because I, I don't know, do not have a good experience. I don't, I don't have a volume of experience with what 
you know, a Korean or Filipino or Vietnamese adult would want or expect out of animation. So that's kind of outside my expertise, unfortunately. Um, Game Escape asks, what's your opinion on Ranma 1 half? Kind of complicated in the sense that I've tried to like Ranma 1 half, but it's never really connected for me. Ranma 1 half is funny, lighthearted, and goofy. And I think you have to be in that mood and, and up for that kind of a story. To me, it was just a little too lighthearted and a little too goofy. The stories don't... This, the plot is really there as an excuse for comedy and occasional action sequences. Part of my frustration with Rama One Half is that I'm an aficionado of martial arts, in, of martial arts cinema, meaning I like watching martial arts well represented in film. Uh, or, you know, TV or animation, what have you. Um, I, I like to see how m characters with different skill levels are put up against each other and how all that works out. And in Rama One Half, while it has that martial arts background, that's really not what it's there for. So the martial arts is just... Um, it's a silly excuse for more jokes, basically. You know, th there's no real skill level between the characters in any sensible sense. Um, again, it's just it's kind of a goofy comedy. Um, it also has that fundamental Rumiko Takahashi approach where it is, a lot of it is frustrational humor. It is, these characters want this thing, but these other characters are standing in the way for hundreds of episodes. Um, and again, it's the kind of thing that, that can work for a lot of people, but it's just not my kind of story. It, it, to me, I find that frustrating, um, not endlessly uh, humorous. Uh, Cruz Gonzalez asks, have you seen any Satoru Akahori anime? I don't recognize that name. If you list off some of the anime, I can, I can tell you. Um, do you not enjoy comedy for comedy's sake? I do. Uh, a lot of my favorite anime are just screwball comedies. I think the problem is that I went into Ranma 1 Half, and whenever I watch Ranma 1 Half, Ranma 1 Half bills itself as a martial arts comedy. It is themed around martial arts, but the martial arts don't matter. That's my frustration. Um, Kadocha, for example, Child's Toy, is an anime series that I adore with all my heart. It is about a 12-year-old girl who is also a, um, a young film actor who works on a live-action TV show. And that is a show that is, it's got comedy, and, but that all works into the story and the comedy. You know, the comedy is informed by her stresses holding down a job while also being an elementary school girl. And how those interrelate. So the fact that the martial arts in Rama 1 Half doesn't do that, I think, is what really gave me a problem. Um, also, a lot of it just comes down to personality. And the personalities in Rama 1 Half, I think that's something that I, I enjoyed and got used to, but I didn't really latch on to any of the characters in Rama 1 Half. And it's a classic problem with a lot of these comedies, where... If you, it's the same thing with sitcoms. Like, if you don't like the characters in Friends, you're not going to watch that show. Um, you know, if you don't latch on to one or two of those characters, it's going to be hard for you to, to really keep watching it. That was my problem with Ranma. Um, let's see here. Well, that's the thing. Exactly, Bruno. You know, um, uh, you know, one of the reasons I don't like Dragon Ball is that the martial arts don't matter. Um, I, I do not enjoy Dragon I enjoy Dragon Ball in its opening chapters when it was this silly adventure story because that fit the tone where martial arts don't matter it's about you know sneaking into a castle and rescuing you know or, or finding an artifact um so you, know, you don't have to have realistic martial arts for that but when they turn it into you know long tournaments where characters are trying to to beat each other and that matters but it turns out it doesn't matter that's frustrating to me um see here. Um, yeah, if you're having trouble with the goofiness in Tenchi in Tokyo, you're going to have a real problem with Ranma. Now, Tenchi in Tokyo is unusual in that Tenchi in Tokyo has absurd, dumb, over-the-top comedy, and then, for like six episodes, and then a moment of, of real serious character drama. Um, where suddenly they will turn everything around and say, actually, this thing that you've been laughing at is really sad. 
and they go back to the goofy comedy for another six episodes. So it's a weird mix. Um, I, I love certain moments in Tenchi in Tokyo, but the rest of it is just really hard to get, uh, get around. Um, but uh, now, Rony Kenshin is a great example there. Where I, that, that is my favorite shonen series. And the thing about Kenshin is that there is a... There is lip service paid to the physics of the fights in that there is almost always a trick. There's almost always some physics-based trick or element to a character's fighting style that if you figure out, you can counter or deal with. So a lot of the tension is figuring out what is the character doing, right? Um, that happens sometimes in Dragon Ball Z and these other shows, but it's usually something that then results in something um, unbelievable, whereas in Kenshin it's a little more grounded. So, while that is silly in Kenshin, I, I, I was more able to deal with it in that show. Right. Um, ah, okay, Saber Marion J, I'm gonna Bashi, Sorcerer's Hunters. That's funny, I have not, despite that, you know, I love the 90s, I love 90s anime. I don't think I've seen any of those. I actually have Saber Marion at J, I, I found a copy of that and bought it recently. Um, I think I've seen a bit of Sorcerer's Hunters. Um, I watched the first episode of Abnobashi, and I got really creeped out by the, you know, um, preteen girl loses her panties in the first episode, and, like, for the rest of the show, apparently, she's trying to keep herself from flashing everyone. Uh, that just, that, that running gag I found to be just in, in poor taste, and I was just, I was kind of, one of those things where I was like, I, I'm worried about where that's going. And but I loved the tone of that, of that opening episode of Abinobashi. Uh, that melancholy of the fact that these shopping arcades are dying and what are we going to do? And here's our chance. Um, but that, that particular thing just at the time weirded me out enough to where I, I moved on to other things. Um, I think I can now I can go back and watch it, but it was just, you know, one of those weird things. Um, do I, <coughs> excuse me. I really want to watch um, Saber Marionette J, because that was huge at the time and is completely forgotten now, and I want to see what the, the elements of that were. Um, yeah, I don't like over-the-top fighting. I, I, I find over-the-top fighting... Um, it's basically a shouting match. Where I'm like, but, you know, the person who wins is going to be whoever the writer... is going to be whoever... The writer decides in his head is going to win or her head. It doesn't, you know. Th there's no logical consequence of the fighting. That's what I, I want. Logical consequences. You know, if you have over the top fighting. Now, if it's if the over the top fighting doesn't matter, that's a different thing. Um, good example is there is a segment in Anime Mirai, Young Animators Training Project from 2013, I think, um, uh, which was I don't know, like the adventures of Aki Chan or something. And it's basically sort of a Dragon Ball Z setup where there's this kid out in the wilderness who has this ridiculous um, you know, martial arts master and somebody shows up and sort of challenges the kid uh, and the kid ends up trouncing the guy. And it's ridiculous over-the-top fighting, but it, it's basically a, a comedy and a moral tale about being too big for your britches. So I didn't mind that the, the martial arts was kind of an excuse for that. That's the kind of thing. Um, I have no interest whatsoever in JoJo's. Uh, everything I've seen about JoJo's tells me that is a show that I will despise. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm just not, not interested at all in JoJo. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the thing. So, uh, uh, JoJo asks, do you tend to forgive anime or movies which acknowledge themselves as bad? I don't believe in good or bad. Um, I, I, I find those terms to be profoundly unhelpful in judging a work. Uh, they tend to be, in reviews and such, code for I liked it or I didn't like it. They tend to be essentially subjective terms when we use them. Um, and there are movies I like and I don't like, and I'm entertained by and I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not entertained by. And other people call good or bad, but I'm like, if I was entertained, even if it had Low budget special effects, so what? Right? I don't need big budget to be entertained. I, I don't need, you know, uh, Marlon Brando's acting to be entertained. So that's different. 
Favorite Digimon series, Tamers, season three. No question. Head and shoulders above the rest. Second favorite would probably be season one, Adventure. Um, but Tamers has, it has darkness, it has complexity, it has thematic ties back to other shows. Um, it's just, it's, it's, you know, it is head and shoulders, you know, it is trying harder than the other series of Digimon. Um, now, I haven't seen every season of Digimon, I should, I should point out. Um, especially some of the ones after Tamers. I watched, you know, a few episodes here and there. But that, Tamers is just, there's, there's so much going on there. Um, have I seen Kaiji? I have not. That, that is not a show I have, I have watched. Um... Yeah. This gets back to that question I often get, what's your favorite anime series? Eh, depends. It depends on what I'm like at the moment. Um, if you want to explain why Mushishi is good, again, I don't think it's good. Um, if, I were to t if I were to recommend it to other people, I would say Mushishi is a, an anime series about a man who tries to essentially exorcise small spirits small creatures, microscopic creatures, that can worm its way into people and influence them, um, often in negative ways. So they can cause growths on you. And often these things will give you abilities, that we, what, what these mushi, these little creatures do, give you abilities that can be helpful in certain ways, but they're almost always detri detrimental in major ways. So he goes around to tiny little villages, all scattered around. Uh, this gives it sort of a Twilight Zone element to it, so it's, it's very much about these little stories of individual people and what they've done. And you get these little morality plays in each episode. Um, there's really no overarching plot, but each episode gives you something to think about. Uh, gives you something about human nature to deal with. That's how I explain things to people. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm not saying they will like it or they won't like it. I tell them what the show is, what the work is. Um, you give them a sense of its complexity and, and, and how it approaches its things, and then they can decide for themselves, right? Um, have I seen the first two movies, OVAs? Yeah, I, I've seen all the movies slash OVAs from the first three, um, and I think the, 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 uh, the one from Savers as well I watched, but definitely those, you know, all the ones from Adventure, all the ones from uh, Season 2, and all the ones from Tamers, which... <laughs> I mean, the, the, the quality definitely bounces up and down amongst all of those. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, let's see here. What kind of struggles do Seiyu experience in Japan? So there's an anime series called Seiyu's Life, which is an excellent overview of this. The reality is that Seiyus have the advantage, voice actors, that they are, they have more flexibility than animators. So a voice actor can, it's a good question, can have a singing career. They can do voiceover. They can work in video games. They can do a lot of different things, whereas animators kind of have to draw. And because of the pressures in the animation industry, like that is kind of all you can do. You, you don't have time for a side project, whereas in voice acting, because of how these things are scheduled, you, know, you may go in for four hours in a day, and then you have the rest of the day free. Now, the problem is when you're first starting out, there is huge turnover in voice actors during their first three years or so of their careers. Um, because it is very hard to get enough work to support yourself. As I understand it, most voice actors in their um, uh, first years have day jobs or part-time jobs or other ways of paying the rent. Um, or they're, you know, living at home, things like that. Just because, again, like with any career, like any entertainment career like that, uh, it's like being an actor in Hollywood. Um, you know, you're not going to get booked solid in your first three months. But you do have a lot of other flexibility there. So Seiyus can make a lot of money. And uh, once a Seiyu gets established and, and they're kind of doing their thing, um, they can live very, very comfortably as a voice actor. And especially doing other gigs on the side again, you can you know, do a voiceover for a nature documentary, for example, things along those lines, and, you know, you, you can get a lot of that work. It's one of the reasons why, by the way, when you're looking at voice acting credits, you'll see someone will do, you know, two or three shows a year, but they're certainly not filling up their schedule with voice acting work. Um, that's because they're generally doing 
other voice work along with that, video games, etc. and so forth. Uh, and it's the same thing in in America over here, by the way, too. There are there's almost nobody who's actually, you know, a full time anime voice actor in America. You need to do a lot. But good luck with the Subway Restaurant, Master Chief. Thanks for stopping by. Can I recommend some dark sci fi anime from the '90s? Absolutely. So um, what leaps to mind is Lily Cat, L I L Y C A T. And um, that is essentially a remake of the movie Alien with a ten tentacle monster. So, yay. I've actually watched, uh, I believe, the original version of that. And I, I, w I was sure that this was like you know, a, a re-edited hentai. Apparently it is not. Um, it is a monster with tentacles, but you know nothing sexy happens. So, weird. Um, so Lily Cat certainly um, is there. That, that's dark sci-fi. Um, the Giver... Oddly enough, which may have been like 1990, um, maybe even 89, I'm not sure, but it was, it was around 1990, um, which is on the surface a very goofy, you know, guy transforms into sort of an Ultraman style character. There's a lot of really dark stuff in the underlying story, and there's kind of some body horror going on in the Giver. Other dark sci fi. You get some weird stuff, like Dominion Tank Police is a goofy comedy, but it has a, some very dark. Um, sequences in it. There's a, a very dark sequence in the, in the middle of the OVA. Um, other than that, I mean, Demon City Shinjuku. Well, that's fantasy. That's that's really fantasy. Um, dark science fiction of the '90s. Robot Carnival, anthology film. But there's some dark, dark episodes in that, including the um, sequences that bookend the film. What else? I mean, anime generally isn't that, I don't know, it can be pretty dark. Um, but there's pressure to be not too dark, right? Uh, there's, there's pressure to be reasonably light because just darkness doesn't sell. So that's, that's one of those, those issues. Um, let's see here. Um, let me think of any others that kind of leap to mind. I'm looking over at my manga collection to see if any, any of those provoke my head. I'm sure there are others. Dark stuff. Do you know cyber? Fair enough. Um, how do I differentiate between sci-fi and space, such as Foundation by Isaac Asimov, and a drama or epic which happens to be in space, such as Star Wars? So, uh, Star Wars is not science fiction, because it is set in the past. Uh, in my opinion, science fiction always has to be about, always has to be set in the future. Um, and ideally should be recognizably about, um, about that stuff. I don't think Technolize was 90s, though. I think Technolize came out in the early 2000s. Um, but yes, definitely dark science fiction. Um, yeah, Star Wars is space fantasy, in my, my, um, my view. Uh, let's see here. Oh, X! Well, no, that, that's fantasy, technically. X is fantasy. Um, definitely dark. Let's see here. Oh, um, well, no, that's 80s. Pits of the North Star. I mean, Fist of the North Star is ridiculous and over the top, but it's also dark in the sense that there's, you know, people killing each other. Um, yeah, so Project Echo, so Project Echo, interesting backstory here for those who don't know. Uh, so the, uh, Project Echo is this sci-fi comedy uh, about a, a girl who is extremely strong and agile, like superhero level strong and agile, but just wants to be a normal high school girl. Uh, and then aliens invade and she has to, she... She ends up kind of protecting Earth from these aliens while she's also fighting off her rival in school. It's a very goofy concept, very goofy show, but very over the top and very, very intentionally goofy, right? Um, it is kind of wired into that concept. Uh, Project Echo was originally going to be hentai. Uh, it was part of a this thing called uh, Cream Lemon, which is basically which is basically the, the first hentai series, a hentai OVA. Um, if you look it up, be, be aware that it is, it is very early hentai and, and there's some stuff in there that's, it's, it's pretty extreme. Uh, and the staff actually made this little goofy sci-fi story within, um, uh, within the Cream Lemon series. And basically every episode is by a different, different group, but sometimes they come back and do new episodes. And so they did this, this goofy little sci-fi story, and then they started working on another goofy little sci-fi, you know, hentai story. And they kind of 
got bigger and bigger and bigger, and they realized, hey, wait, why not just, you know, remove all of the sex and turn this into a full-scale, you know, a movie, and that became Project Deco. So it was an experiment in that sense. It also, this it was made um, at pretty much the height of the Japanese bubble economy. Lots of money flowing into the to the anime industry. Um, uh, it was before the big Akira push, but there was there was money around. So there was a lot of animators who worked on Project Echo and kind of had the freedom in that movie to just kind of animate and produce very high quality sequences in Project Echo, even though like they they the sequences don't really add anything to the film. Uh, they, they just, okay, we need a shot of this space cruiser. Okay, we're going to do this ridiculous shot of the space cruiser. So it's that kind of a thing. Where, yes, it's definitely experimental, but it, it came out of that weird area. Um, and yeah, and the 80s were also an experimental time for animation and for anime in general. Folks were pushing the boundaries of the medium in a lot of interesting ways. Uh, I'm actually putting together a panel right now, uh, A Brief History of Mecha. Brief History of Giant Robots, where I'm finding a lot of these weird uh, uh, stories, these weird, um, not necessarily weird stories, a lot of these more influential mecha series um, throughout time. And there's some interesting stuff in the 80s, really, that folks uh, um, aren't as aware of over there. Um, how would I describe Twilight, the American book series, and do you like it as a romance story? I do not like it as a romance story. Um, now, here, and here's a good example of this. Um, I mean, so Twilight is fantasy romance. It, it's a, you know, Romance series with fantastical elements. Um, so Twilight is a romance story. It is not a bad romance story in the sense that it establishes its characters, it establishes um, what, what the characters find interesting in each other, and then develops that romance. It is a bad romance story in that it is a very unhealthy relationship between the two characters. And nobody seems to acknowledge that in the story. So it's that's the problem I have with Twilight, is that those characters should not be together. <laughs> Given how, what they establish about vampires and, and about Bella and all these characters, it's like, you should be running away! But, you know. Um, oh, of course! I mean, gosh. Heh. Well, there's the obvious one. Thank you, Bruno. Dark sci-fi science fiction from the 90s, Evangelion. I mean, that is almost the canonical answer, right? When was M.D. Geist? Was M.D. Geist 80s? Because that's definitely dark science fiction, right? Who hasn't seen Evangelion? A lot of people have not seen Evangelion. A lot of people are intimidated by Evangelion, frankly. People rant and rave about Evangelion so much. People, you know, build up Evangelion so much that a lot of people sit down and watch. I had a question about this at a, at a con not too long ago, where somebody said, what is the deal with Evangelion? Like, why should I watch it? Um, because people we kept telling her, this, you know, this, Evangelion is the greatest thing humanity's ever made. And she's like, what? So that is, you know, that is a you know, legitimate concern, is that folks have built this up. Um, that's a problem, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, and I've pledged to myself that this year I will watch Evangelion in its entirety. I've watched the beginning and the end, but not the middle. So this year at some point, you know, I'm going to do my best to, to watch all of Evangelion. And I know where it's, I mean, I... Now that I know where, it, know where it's going, I can kind of orient myself around the, the series. Um, but, yeah. And I'm sure it's coming back to DVD soon. I mean, there's just no question. Somebody's going to license it. It's, it's very expensive to license, apparently, by the way. Of the, you know, the, the Japanese are, you know, hold out on licensing the anime series for a lot of money. It's one of the reasons we don't get Evangelion on DVD a lot. You know, they're not continually re-releasing it for that reason. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm, I'm, when I go back and look at those, uh, those, uh, um, those, those threads, I keep looking for Evangelion, clicking through to see, ooh, you know, is it time yet? Are people starting to do it? 
you know, at this point in anime history, people are watching it on, and they're praising it. Um, but in many cases, they're, they're partway through it. They haven't gotten to the end yet. Um, it, had, it had finished in Japan by this point, but folks were just starting to get it like, legitimately over here in America. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Eve is all about happy rainbows and penguins. It's true. And unicorns occasionally. Um, that's all Evangelion is. It's not sad at all. Not, not dark. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what, what, uh, what happens to Evangelion. Uh, this week I did see a reference to somebody saying that, uh, Disney was going to make a live action Sailor Moon movie. That was a, a rumor that somebody had posted on the forum. And it's like, no, and I think it was just somebody essentially trolling and you know, seeing if anyone would believe this. It was like, Dis what? There was some fun stuff in there, but, you know, it, that did catch a few people who were like, no, Disney's the devil. Disney's evil. We, we must stop Disney. We should start a petition. It's like, based on one person claiming something on the internet. Hold your horses. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm not familiar with the manga con named One. With, with that person. Um, what, what has he made? I, I may be m misunderstanding the quote. Um, have I read Tsubasa Reservoir Chronicle? Just the beginning. I, I read like the first volume of the manga. I watched a bit, little bit of the anime series. Uh, but it is so hard to... Uh, there were so many character references in Tsubasa. I was like, I feel like I need to go back and read like all of Cardcaptor Sakura and all of Magic Knight Ray Earth and all these other things to kind of understand Tsubasa. So I got kind of intimidated by, by Tsubasa and, uh, and held off on it. So maybe one of these days, maybe once I dig back more into the, the Clamp universe, I'll try it. I don't know. Um, Karyon asked, who's the character in the picture frame behind you? That's an excellent question. That is Akari Kanzaki from Battle Athletes and Battle Athletes Victory, which is a now sadly very obscure anime series about sports about girls who are competing in a sort of a, an Olympics, a, uh, uh, a competition where everyone involved has to compete in every sport. And um, it's a really weird concept, actually based on a Sega Genesis game. Um, but it turned into this surprisingly well-structured, well-rounded anime series where, you know, it, it, has, it's, it has comedy, it has action, sports action, uh, it has drama, it has melodrama, it has character development. Uh, one of those things where I watched it, I was like, this is really, like, it all comes together. Like, they did an impressive job on this show. So I managed to find a uh, pan cell from the original OVA, which are usually very expensive. Ah, oh, One Punch Man and Mob Psycho 100. Um, I, I've not seen much of either. Um, again, Shonen just doesn't really appeal to me. I saw some of Mob Psycho, Mob Psycho 100. Um... Yeah, it, I'm, from what I've seen, I'm not convinced that he's deconstructing Shonen. I think he's parodying Shonen. You know, I think he's playing around with Shonen archetypes, but he's not really proving anything about them. He's not really um, delving deep into those archetypes, and he's not really um, um, moving beyond those archetypes and, and those themes. So, I don't know. Let's see here. Um, yeah, now we have a, a Blu-ray Masters for Evangelion. That's, I wonder if that's one of the things that's kind of holding back Evangelion licensing over here, is that once they saw they were working on that, they're like, oh, actually, we can wait until that's ready. Who knows? Um, Fisher says, I noticed a new trend in anime this and last season, where Moe-type characters are placed into a post-apocalyptic world to tell a slice-of-life story. To me, it's an interesting idea. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's an interesting concept. And I think that's what, what we've been seeing since about around 2011 now. We started seeing more of these Moe characters in non-traditional Moe things. I think Fractal is the classic example of that, where it's, it's not post-apocalyptic, but it is this far future, sort of idyllic, utopian world that turns out to have a seedy, um, not underbelly, but a, a seedy side to it. And you get Moe characters kind of in that milieu where it's a um, it's a complex setting. I think that's a that's a, a really cool 
really cool concept. I think you know, the reality is Moe is now more or less an art style. I, I think we're, we're now going to see just Moe as a, a way character, a way female characters are represented, and that's just going to be the thing. But we're going we're to have all the same fantasy and science fiction and all the other genres in there. Just that's going to become the visual representation of, of, of female characters. That's the thing. Hey, Raven. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Dropkicks. <laughs> um, let's see here. Have I seen the pause and select YouTube videos? I don't think so, no. I've um, heard Yami no Matsue. I do not recognize Yami no Matsue. The Buddhist asks, thoughts on the recent popularity of Japan and Hollywood wanting to make live-action adaptations of anime? Uh, Attack on Titan, Kenshin, Ghost in the Shell, Fumel Alchemist, Jojo, and Tokyo Ghoul, for example. Um, so that is, let's be honest, folks chasing the money. And that's not a bad thing. Money is how things get made. And here's the thing. If you owned the, the rights to Mob Psycho 100 and a Hollywood producer came to you and said, we would like to give you $25 million for the rights to that to make a Hollywood live action movie, would you refuse? Even knowing that it might not be ideal, but think of how many anime projects you could make for that money. Think of how many Evan, how many Bebops you could make, how many Evangelions you could make, for the the price of licensing one of these shows. And I, I don't, I'm not saying it's always that that big of a figure, but you know it's going to be a serious figure. So I think that's that's the reality: is that if those deals go through, we could see some ridiculously awesome stuff out of the anime industry. Um, I think it is also proof that anime has effectively become mainstream in America in the sense that everyone knows this thing now. Everyone is aware that anime exists as a medium. And so Hollywood's no longer scared of it. It is willing to make adaptations of these things because they know folks will, will turn up to watch the thing, which is good. You know, I think, again, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It can be done well, it can be done poorly. There are lots of different factors involved. Uh, and I think, like, like with anything, it's, it's really hard to adapt anime to live action. So we're going to see failures, we're going to see bad stuff before we see the good stuff. Um, and that's just kind of the reality of it. Um, and then you've got stuff like, um, you know, Kenshin, which is not Hollywood live action, that is Japanese live action. Um, and that remained extremely faithful to the original, but that's being made in Japan for a, an audience that probably grew up watching that show on TV. Kenshin was huge when it came out. So they have different pressures and that they would have over here, making say Ghost in the Shell, where the average moviegoer going to see Ghost in the Shell you know, didn't grow up watching Ghost in the Shell. So, you know, Blessing and Curse, where you're not as limited, but you don't have things to fall back on. Right. Um... The sumo anime. Yeah, I'd, I'd heard that there is a sumo-themed anime series com coming out, which is cool. Um, good to see stuff like that. Um, you know, and here's the other thing, and this is part of going back and watching those, or reading those old threads. This is what we all wanted back in the day. We would have loved to have seen a Hollywood live-action adaptation of Ghost in the Shell, even if it wasn't a perfect rendition of the show. Um, folks would have complained about it, sure. But the idea, just the very idea of a big budget Hollywood ad adaptation of an anime film and the kind of audience that would bring to anime was something we all slavered over. Slathered over. Slavered. Drooled over. Right? Um, it's, you know, it has its drawbacks. Um, it's not necessarily a great thing, but it, it does have its advantages. Um, do you think it's similar to how anime or otaku were first acknowledged by Japanese media where it got a stigma attached to it and the similar thing is happening to the USA where they're called weebs? Yes. That's a really good point, uh, Jode, is that I think, um, I really don't like the term weebs because I think that that is a, a slur and I, I think it's, it's just like, really? Like, and again, we already have the, the word otaku, which has the flexibility that you can, you know, you can you can mean it in a slightly more positive or slightly more negative way anyway, otaku. So I think weeb is, is clearly denigrating, and I really wish folks would stop using that. Um, 
but yeah, I think I think we're certainly seeing that. I think we're seeing, seeing and I think that's simply a matter of, as Gandhi said, uh, uh, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win, right? I think that's just folks having, you know, it, it's folks not understanding something, and so having to make fun of it, and that's that's fine. It means we've moved on from ignoring it, which is good. Um, which means that probably the next phase is going to be people are going to start screaming and yelling about nudity in anime and hyperviolence and all that. And we're, you know, we're going to see a backlash against anime in the West. Like a, a concerted backlash. Probably. Who knows? But... Uh, Karyon mentions Netflix going to be a huge influence on how the mainstream audience in the West is going to perceive anime going forward. Possible. Um, I don't know. I think... Um, it's hard to say because Netflix is going in so many directions right now that their experiments with anime feel like they are experiments. Like they're off on the edges. I'm not seeing the average person who has a Netflix subscription checking out the anime on Netflix just because it's on Netflix. That's the, that's the interesting thing. Maybe that'll happen. We have to, you know, wait for a while. But the audience is so fragmented. Uh, I'm curious to see if Netflix is really going to bring more people in or not. And maybe that's, yeah, I'm, I don't know, that's not necessarily their intention. I think, they're, I think Netflix is definitely trying to bring the anime audience to them rather than trying to convert the average American into an anime fan. Um, but we'll see. Thoughts on anime being produced into 3D CGI. Recently, Berserk was adapted to 3D and received poorly. New Saint Seiya was um, to have uh, 3D on a technical level. Can 3D work for anime? So, Sean, yes, absolutely. And I, ha and, and I can say that with absolute conviction because of one thing. Land of the Lustrous, which came out this past season. Watch Land of the Lustrous. The characters are all CGI, and it is gorgeous. And not just gorgeous, it works. It is a visually effective way of telling that story and so yeah it no question now one example does not make a trend one data point is not a trend in other words it can be done but i'm sure land of the lustrous was relatively expensive it sure looks expensive and so the question is whether that will extend to other things and we see stuff like CGI, um, you know, used extensively in things like um, Girls in a Panzer, where all the tanks are CGI, but the girls are hand-drawn. I think that will work. Um, the anime I said was Land of the Lustrous, which I forget the Japanese name for that off the top of my head. Um, but it's really, really cool. Um, favorite Pokemon? I have no idea. I, I, have, I, have, a, I have watched... Enough Pokemon to not be interested in Pokemon. I've never played any of the video games. Pokemon came... I, Pokemon came when I was an adult, by the way, too. So, you know, I was like 25 when Pokemon came out in America. So, I, it was one of those... You know... I did not grow up with that franchise, which so just wasn't aimed at me. So, it, 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 it missed me. Um, great answers, Bruno, to dark sci-fi from the 90s. Infinite Revias, great pick. Yes, dark science fiction from the 90s, definitely. Um, yeah, and I should clarify that. Um, it's not that I don't like Pokemon. Uh, Pokemon is just a null op for me. It's just, I see it, it's cute. If, if, I'm, if it's on, you know, if somebody's watching Pokemon, I will watch Pokemon and enjoy it. But I have, n you know... Nothing sucks me into that franchise. I, I you know, I, I have no interest. It's like somebody who's not into football watching football. You know, I can see it, I can understand it, but I'm not going to cheer for the Steelers, right? It's just that one of those things. And I totally recognize the the quality and appeal of Pokemon. You know, it's nothing against Pokemon. It's just not my thing. Yeah, I'm kind of like a dad, but a dad who's watched like a thousand anime. So, um. Yeah. Um, you're right, Liquidus. You know, Love Live's, you know, one of the reasons Love Live works is they, they've got, you know, Bondi behind them. And Bondi is... Well, it's a funny thing. I mean, Bondi was in trouble a couple of years ago. They barely made a profit. Like, in 2013, I think. They had to have this whole, you know, we're going to turn around the company push. 
Um, and they were really, it was really scary for a while. Uh, favorite Naoki Urasawa work? Ooh, Pluto. Pluto, definitely. Uh, which is his ad adaptation of an Astro Boy story into a, a like an eight-volume manga. And it's just brilliantly done. Um, just as fantastic. I have not finished watching 20th Century Boys, though. Oh, reading 20th Century Boys. That might be up there, depending on how that goes. Uh, I do have all of it, in fact. All, well, you can't see it, but... I have all of 20th Century Boys, so it's, at, at some point I will, I will finish 20th Century Boys. Um, or I'm a member of Team Rocket, that's true. Actually, I lie. Um, about favorite Pokemon. My favorite Pokemon is Meowth. Because, you know... When Pokemon came out, I was actually doing a lot of volunteer work with with teenage with uh, tween boys, so I kind of felt a a responsibility to at least check out the shows they were talking about. So I watched a few episodes of Pokemon. And I've seen a few uh, episodes since, and I just love Meow Meowth's person. I love Meowth's personality. Sorry, um, Meowth was just yeah that yeah. He was fun, fun to watch. And it's true, I am a Digimon fan more than a Pokemon fan. Because you know, Digimon has a plot. It, it Things change from episode to episode, and it deals with, like, tough emotional issues frequently. Um, Pokemon does occasionally, but Digimon is a little more committed to improving the lives of its audience. Um, and again, nothing against Pokemon, it's just, it's that's not its focus. Um... Um, have I seen Box of Goblins? Morio no Hako. That sounds familiar. I don't think so, though. I don't think. Um, yeah, I, and I do just love the idea of a Pokemon that, like, has a mouth, and it has a personality, and that is, you know, um, trying to make it on its own. Like, that was just a, a cool concept. But most of the Pokemon are just kind of there. Um, which, again, is, is kind of a, 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 a choice. Um... Which, which was the last time you cried of happiness watching or reading an anime? Last time I cried of happiness? That's a really interesting question. Um, I cry more now than I used to. Certainly true. Um, I've gotten emotional over manga and anime. I don't know that I cry of happiness per se. Um... Oh, um, was probably, and this was a little while ago now, though, the last one I remember is from Up on, pa ah, from Up on Poppy Hill. Is that the whole storyline of those characters? Um, I just got really emotionally involved in Poppy Hill, and that just, that just got to me, I think. Oh, also, no, uh, The Wind Rises. Uh, when he's sitting next to his wife who's sick and they're holding hands, that just got to me emotionally. I, you know, I got that. Um, spoilers, Jod. Careful. Um, but, uh, yeah, then that, that, uh, speaking of emotional moments in anime, yeah, that, that scene in Ancient Majesty's Bride was, that was good, that was some good anime there. That, oh, I used the word, good anime, ah! Um, but, you know, that, that was some well-structured, you know, effectively, effectively made anime there. What about Yu-Gi-Oh, you ask? Okay, I'm gonna say it. I think Yu-Gi-Oh's dumb. I understand why people enjoy it. I understand why it's, it's a, it's a fun thing. But, to me, externally, watching Yu-Gi-Oh, it just, it is... It is all those elements of Yu-Gi-Oh that I complain about, or all those elements of Shonen that I complain about, all kind of summed up in Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, it just doesn't doesn't appeal to me. And granted, I've never watched significant amounts of Yu-Gi-Oh, just, you know, clips here and there. Duel Masters, nope, no interest. Um, you know. And granted, Yu-Gi-Oh is, okay, I'm going to say something again that's kind of controversial. I think Yu-Gi-Oh is meant to be dumb. Meaning, it is meant to be over-the-top and silly and ridiculous, right? Um, I think its tone and all of that stuff is all part of a package that is meant to appeal to a certain element, especially in, like, 
nine to ten year old boys who really like certain, you know, cool flashy things. Um, and it's not it's not a terrible thing. It's it's not horrible. You know, you're not wrong for enjoying that, um, which is the kind of thing that doesn't appeal to me personally. Um, having a tough time getting through anime now. We watched more than hundred anime in 2016. Wow. Bruno, that's amazing. Slogging through Nadesco. Okay, if you're slogging through Nadesco, you absolutely there's something wrong. <laughs> okay, that's that's an issue. Um, wow, um, I can't imagine slogging through Nadesco. If you don't like Nadesco, boy. So my recommendation for you, um, Bruno, is a couple of things. Uh, if you haven't already, um, just start looking up anime in genres you like. So don't worry about recent stuff, don't worry about old stuff, don't worry about what's, what's the classics. Just look up, you know, if you like sci-fi, look up great sci-fi anime and start, you know, trying to find stuff in that genre that you, you really like. If you, um, if that's not working for you, I recommend just stop watching anime. Just take a break, do other stuff, watch cheesy 80s sci-fi movies, you know, read fantasy novels, whatever, do whatever you want. But sometimes you need to take a break. I've, I've been there before. Um, I've definitely had times where I had to just completely go cold turkey on anime because I had lost the spark. Um, so I'm, I'm totally with you there on that. Um, and it's, it's tough and it's hard. But just remember, you are bigger than your, your interest in anime. Uh, you can absolutely move on to other... Um, other mediums, other other hobbies, uh, at least for a while, and eventually come back, maybe. But don't worry about it. Like, take a break. That's that's totally cool. Um. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a interesting way of putting it, uh, Karyon, about Pokemon versus Yu-Gi-Oh versus Digimon. Um, let's see here. Jay Decker. Um, I cry at the end of every favorite anime. Why? Um, knowing there's no more episodes. Yeah. I actually had the opposite problem. I find I stop watching anime like two-thirds or three-quarters of the way through because I realize I don't want to get to the ending. I don't want... A, I don't want there to be an ending, and I don't want to be disappointed by the ending that's actually there. I would rather be imagining in my head the, the ending I want than verify the actual ending. Uh, and it's not great. It's not, you know, smart. Um, but that is something I, I struggle with a lot, is finishing an anime and realizing, oh. Um, okay, fair enough, Bruno. Um, you don't like Mecha. See, yeah, I, I see Mecha and I, I in, um, immediately just, you know, lean forward into that. Um, have I seen Idion? Yes. Um, I, I skipped a few episodes in the middle. There's some filler that I, I, I missed, but I've, I've seen most of Idion, uh, and both of the movies. You want dark anime? There you go. Obviously it's 1981, or 1980, but still, yeah, that's, that's dark, especially the movies. I mean, uh, you know, the second Idion movie has the highest body count in any anime I've ever heard of. So, there you, there you go, there you have it. By far. What was Eureka 7 about? That's a good question. I never finished Eureka 7, um, which I, and I want to someday, but it, it got... Um, the plot started bouncing, started moving all over the place. It started getting kind of diffused plot-wise. So I took a break from it and haven't come back to Eureka 7. So one of, the, one of, the, one of these days. Um, might be an old guy thing, definitely. Now, I'll finish a game, but... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll finish things, but for anime I love, that's, that's, that's something where I'm like, I, I get a, a weird block. But I'm pushing through it. I'm, I'm getting better. Uh, let's see here. Recommend me good sports anime. Again, I don't believe in good. Um, what sports do you like? I mean, I will actually definitely, you know, if you want to, I mean, sports anime, battle athletes victory. That is the anime that helped me, somebody who didn't understand sports at all and did not get the appeal of it at all, made me understand and appreciate the appeal of sports, of being involved in sports, of cheering for sports. 
I, I went 180. I didn't become like a, a huge sports fan, but I, I got it after Battle Athletes Victory. Um, um, other sports anime, I mean, again, again, you know, we could go all night with classics of the sports genre. Ashida no Joe, um, Ice Shield 21, um, uh, with, uh, um, Aim for the Top, heck. Um, you know, all sorts of stuff. Princess Nine, which I haven't seen. I'll, I want to watch that some, some soon. Um, now I've gotten into uh, video games of late. What are thoughts on how games like Akiba and Nier capture the anime aesthetic? Great question, Game Escape. So, I think... Obviously, they're, they're all going for different things. So, Akiba Strip is trying to capture the anime, you know, visual aesthetic in the game art itself, which it does very well. Uh, and it's also trying to rep represent like, what otaku were like. And I think Akiba does a, a great job of parodying otaku culture, where, especially with, like the, the names of people walking around where, you know, otaku and, uh, um, um, you know, I think geek is one of them. And uh, a lot of the different names of, of random people are just funny. And the way the characters behave is, uh, are, I think, reasonably good representations of how otaku see themselves. Um, I don't, I, they're not necessarily realistic, but it's not meant to be, which is fine. Um, Nier is obviously trying to be essentially an anime series in video game form. Uh, it is trying to capture the aesthetic, the pacing, the feel of anime battles, things along those lines. And those, I think, it, it does very effectively. Um, and, I, I mean, again, it, it really depends on what you're trying to do. I'm very impressed with how well they're able to do those things. The thing is, I, I don't want to play Akiba Strip. I don't want a lot of Akiba Strip. I don't want there to be lots of those games around. I think that is a quick creative cul-de-sac. Whereas I think Nier, uh, Nier Automata and those sorts of games are a, um, a much more interesting approach because they are very... They are their own thing. They, are clear, they clearly have a very strong... Uh, message in a, in a very strong style and that always appeals to me when you have all these things that are all coming together in your story um, let's see here big wind up um, am I familiar with the fantasy star games in name only like I've, I've seen clips online I'm, I'm familiar with it but I've, I've never never picked up any of the games um, yeah that's, that's another thing carry on with with final bosses and having to grind like I have very little patience for grinding um, if, if your game says I need to grind, I will probably turn, uh, uh, put it away. Um, it's just like that, that doesn't really appeal to me. Obviously, you know, there are going to be low-level enemies in any game, and that, that's fine. Um, you know, there are going to be random battles in any game, but more than a very, very, very little amount of that, and I just get bored. I'm not interested in that at all. Um, and that's just my, you know, my failing if you will, as a video game fan. It's something that just is, I know will restrict my enjoyment of a lot of important games, but, um, and it depends on the, on the, the monsters, right? You know, if, if it's grinding, but the monsters are fun, that's fine. Um, let's see here. What was the realest real robot show you've seen, 8th MS team? Actually, I'd say probably 0080 War in the Pocket. That is the realest, because there's very little mecha in it, actually. Um, and the mecha is, is cool and big and fun, but it is very much about the emotional reactions, and it is mostly about civilians. Uh, the, you know, the main character is a civilian boy, and it is very much about war from a civilian's perspective. So I think 0080 would, would count. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else, science fiction-wise, that, that counts, yeah, or mecha-wise. Um... Yeah, 0080. Definitely. Let's see here. Rekha about love and understanding. Fair enough. Cool. Um, have I seen Hajime no Ippo? I have not. I've seen, again, clips and bits and pieces here and there. Um, and I've read, like, the plot, and I'm, I'm familiar with, with the show, but I've not actually sat down and watched it yet. And that's long. Have I tried Persona 5? No, I have not. I'm really looking forward to it. I have a lot of, anim a lot of video games on the kind of queued up. I have The Last of Us queued up. Um, I think I have Persona 5 bought and queued up, uh, Final Fantasy 15 queued up, other things, and I'm just trying to make myself finish some of these games and, before I move on to those. I will probably finish 
Nier, and then I will I will I probably won't finish Akiba because I, I found out I am a long way away from the end of Akiba, and I might just say okay, you know I've experienced some of that I will come back to it later but there we go. Um, thoughts on the, the Chevalier Dion? I watched the first episode of, of Chev and it turned me off. Frankly, Chev just was, and it's weird. Chev should be right down my alley, but there was something just kind of, um, nihilistic about Le Chevalier Dion. Uh, I don't know. Will I stream near? Yes. Every, anytime I'm, I'm playing near or, um, or Akiba or any, any game I can stream, I will stream it. Definitely. And I'm trying to aim for Sunday evenings uh, as a streaming time. Um, yeah, Chrono Trigger, there we go. And it's why I like Nier, because there's a mode where, you know, you can, you can grind, but there, you know, grinding is not necessary. And that, that's how I'm playing, and that's what I love. Um, yeah, what I've seen of Fantasy Star, by the way, looks right up my alley. Like, the, the art style, the setting, all the things about Fantasy Star sounds like something I'm really going to enjoy. Just haven't, haven't gone there yet. Um, what is mecha anime about? Generally, mecha anime of the past couple of decades, until pretty recently, but anime, but mecha of the, say, 80s and 90s and 2000s, yeah, um, the mecha is a metaphor for growing up. You are a teenager or a you know a a child essentially with very few responsibilities and then a giant robot shows up and you have to pilot it and it comes with all these responsibilities and expectations of you that are really difficult but you have to essentially man up and deal with that and do it anyway that's usually the metaphor the the, the, the central metaphor for for mecha at least real robot mecha and usually super robot as well um, where, okay, yeah, it, yeah, in Super Robot, it's more fun, but it's still dealing with this, this new responsibility. Uh, let's see here, do 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 Um. Ah, gotcha, Persona 5 has one of those, that, that one of those block things, yeah. Well, one of my, one of the things on my to-buy list is a video capture device. Because I, I also want to stream uh, Switch games. That's another big hole where I've... I put in like 80 hours into Zelda, uh, Breath of the Wild, um, I put quite a few hours into Skyrim already, and um, uh, other games, I, I love to stream those too. Um, okay, you know, I'll, I'll have the PS4 version of Persona. That's good to know, thank you. Um, that, that's kind of one of the big things for me for 2018, so I should mention that. So I've got some, some plans coming up for 2018. While we're waiting for folks to, to ask more questions, there's a um, uh, so in 2018. Now that I've sort of consolidated things down in geek archaeology, I'm looking to kind of level up my stuff. One way uh, to do that is to do more video game um, streams, more video game material, and I'd actually love your your guys' advice either now or in the future. Um, I'm I do not have the 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 time or the capacity to play large numbers of video games to completion, right? Uh, or significant numbers of video games to completion. I just can't put 80 hours into a video game every, you know, week uh, or two weeks or even month. So I'm looking for ways to dive deep into a video game and analyze what's there, at least in how, as much of it as I can possibly experience, without necessarily committing to 80 hours or whatever, 60 hours for a lot of these games. So that's, that's a, you know, that's something on, on the list. But definitely you'll, you'll see more video game stuff in the future. I'll also be reviewing um, more manga in addition to the anime. So I'm going to try to do probably three anime reviews a month. And then one, probably one manga review or like a novel review or something along those lines um, uh, per month. And I also want to do like... Reviews of cheesy 80, 80s movies. I think those will be fun. So looking to expand that and, and do that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see here. And I'm also looking to launch a Patreon. 
Uh, not because I need money, but because I want to provide access to my um, anime convention panel videos. So I've been capturing footage from various anime conventions where I've spoken at, and my plan is to launch a site in the service where if you pay a couple of bucks, you can watch all those panel videos. And the reason I'm not releasing them for free is because those were done at a convention where you had to have paid access to, and it would be um, against the spirit of that anime convention and being invited to these conventions to, to speak to then give away all their content for free, right? So I had to put it behind a little bit of a paywall. It'll be inexpensive, but just, you know, enough to where, okay, you, you drop five bucks in a bucket and you can watch these panel videos. Um, so that is the plan. Uh, it's one of the reasons why you've, you've seen as I'm streaming, I'm, sometimes I'm streaming clips from my panels. I'll probably have one coming up here pretty soon. So that is that. That is, that. Um, that, that is something I'm looking to, to do in uh, the new year. I'm also hoping to launch a thing where you guys can force me to review an anime every month. Uh, that'll also be part of the Patreon. So again, you know, put a, put a dollar into a hat and then you can vote on what anime I review. Something along those lines. Or, you know, uh, recommend an anime for me to review. So those will be coming in 2018. Uh, and also watching a bunch of anime. So that's another big thing. I've identified 27 anime series I'm going to watch in 2018, at least. And those will all get reviewed. And um, they're all known anime that you've probably heard of. Um, or classics. So, Darker Than Black, Evangelion TV, um, Cutie Honey, all sorts of, of, you know, it's a wide variety of stuff, but from, you know, um, a bunch of different eras, mostly stuff from the last, like, 10, 20 years. So that's the, that's the plan. Uh, let's see here, do 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 um, yes, I will be live streaming uh, the, the video game stuff on Twitch, not YouTube, because of all the copyright claim issues on YouTube. Um, so, uh, Twitch is just easier for that. Let's see here. Um, I should point out, um, when I do the uh, make me watch an anime, it will be a movie. Or, an o or a short OVA. You will not be able to force me to watch a TV series because that just gets crazy too, too fast. And, you know, it's hard for me to commit to 13 episodes even, you know, along with everything else, regularly. So it'll be, you know, it'll be a movie or something along, along those lines. I can do that. And I will totally watch a shonen movie. That's, that's fine. Um... Here, do do do. do. Um, what about the live anime uh, viewing we used to have on Twitch? I keep getting taken down. Those videos keep getting flagged on Twitch when I live stream anime. So, like my my, my Twitch channel got taken down for a day when I live streamed. I think it was Ursa Yatsura. So I cannot live stream anime on Twitch. Sadly, I there I I have not found a good way of live streaming anime consistently. Unfortunately. Um, let's see here. So yes, I, I um, not too long ago I said I didn't I didn't want or plan to watch Eva to completion. I mean, again, I've already seen the ending, um, but I changed my mind because I have it on DVD, and uh, you know it's one of those things where I want to check that off my list. Um, and I've gotten a lot of pushback from well, not pushback from people. A lot of people asking me questions about Evan Gellingen and about, you know, what about this thing from episode 17? So I want to be able to speak to that. Um, uh, I appreciate that, uh, Game Escape. Um, I, I, and I totally agree we have good chemistry. Um, I would love to have him here every week. But the reality is I've asked him to be here every week. And almost every week I get a text from him at the last minute saying, sorry, I can't show up this week. You know, um... I'm available, the door's open, you know, but he just can't make it. So we're going to have to dial that back until he's able to reorient things in his life. And I've offered to help him out with, with, with things, um, get the other stuff sort of um, um, handled on his, on his end. He, he, he's busy. But uh, yes, I'm going to, you know, do, I'm, I, I would love to have him here all the time. But that is the reality. Um, uh, no, I'll be watching uh, Evangelion dubbed. Because th there is no way I'm watching Evangelion with subtitles. 
That is, I, having watched Evangelion both ways, subtitles are the wrong choice. Um, let's see here. But yes, I'm, I'm totally open to more, Evan, to more Evan on the channel. We'll just have to have to get that worked out with him. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. That's weird. Huh. Sorry. Something, something, something collapsed. I, I have very strong opinions about uh, dubs versus subs, and especially for, for certain certain works. Subtitles are the wrong choice for Eva because it is a very visual series. Um, Anno communicates a lot with the art and the imagery, you know, that is being shown at you, and often extraordinarily quickly. Um, and when you're watching a subtitle, you are glancing down at the bottom of the screen every five seconds. And I've watched a lot of stuff dubbed and a lot of stuff subbed, and I can tell you, if you're watching something subbed, you are missing stuff visually. Your brain is not that good. Your, your, our lizard brains cannot process all that information, especially when, when something's being thrown at you for like one frame. Um, so, you know, w w w w with something as intentionally, visually um, subtle as Evangelion, you know, you need to be listening, not doing that. You know, not glancing down at subs. Um, you know, even if, you know, there are translation issues, it is, you know, um, those translation issues are less important than seeing what that person is doing, especially with Anno. Anno's a very visual director. He's in, you know, he cares about the visuals and the animation, not so much about the wording of that one line in that one episode. Also, you know, he's not necessarily writing that line. That's all, that, that might be an episode writer. So, you know... Yeah, for, for a series like Anno, you know, you need to be, have all of your attention on the visuals. I would argue that, that Evangelion would, would, would better be watched, would, that, that Evangelion would be well experienced with no audio at all. <laughs> if all visuals fall flat for me, if, if fall flat for you, then why watch anime at all? Turn off the, 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 the video. Right? So, and if you watch Japanese, uh, uh, if you understand Japanese, then absolutely watch, you know, listen to the Japanese dub. That, that's the ideal, definitely, to be able to listen to the original, you know, dialogue as, as it was recorded back in the day. Definitely, you know, listening to Japanese dialogue is, is, is ideal. No, you're, <laughs> you're, I, it, it does not matter how small that screen is. I mean, unless you're watching it, you know, this big, where, like, the text is filling up the screen, but even then, the text is going to be blocking things. Your attention is divided. You know, you, your eyes are glancing up and down. And again, I've tried this all sorts of different ways, dub, then sub, sub, then dub. You know, Japanese audio, um, you know, solely, um, you know, all, all sorts of different options, you know, one before the other, all that kind of stuff. And I have absolutely, con you know, it is very clear to me that having the subs on, you are, you are missing some stuff. Again, not everything, but it is, it, it, it is a significant factor. Our brains are not built for that. They're, they're not built to bounce back and forth between two different things and catch everything. And again, you know, if you're watching Dragon Ball Z, where they communicate a lot and they're, they, they telegraph a lot, it doesn't matter as much because you know, you're not going to get that couple of frames of something that's communicating something that you need to see um, or you know, a little thing you know, over here where you know, in a very complex image. Lane's a good example of that, where there's a lot of stuff hidden in the, Im in the images of Lane, hidden in the background and so forth, that communicate things about that, that story that's hard to immediately pick out unless you're watching the screen. And again, I've, you know, I've watched thousands of hours of anime, and even now, watching subs, I would miss stuff. Um, watch the first episode of Kake, uh, Kakegurui. I have not yet, no. So I watched Hentai Dubbed. 
I would if I could. I have watched hentai dubbed, actually. And that hentai had a famous anime voice actor, American anime voice actor in it. Have I written stories of my own? Yes, quite a few. I am currently working with artists to get one of them animated. And I'm drooling all over myself. That's great. Mm. Also, let's be honest, when you're watching hentai, like, there's not a lot of detail. Like, it's pretty clear what's going on. Not a lot of subtlety in that. Yeah, really old dubbed, dubbed hentai is, is a lot of fun. Would, would, would I tell you about it? Um, give me a little while longer. I'll tell you that in 15 minutes, because it's still a little early in the, uh, in the night. But after it's 11 o'clock my time, I will talk about that. So people ask where I got the, the, the goblet. Um, a, local, a local craft fair, actually. Walking along, I had a bunch of, of mugs and goblets and such, and I looked at that and I was like, that's cool, I'm going to buy one. I don't, I have, I, <laughs> I, I've been calling down my, my possessions. I've been kind of pursuing minimalism over the past few months. And, uh, so boy, mugs just breed. Uh, I've just, I got, you know, I've been kind of getting rid of mugs and mugs and mugs and mugs and mugs. Um, oh, the glass one, this, um, I got it at a kitchen store 20 years ago. It was just one of the, you know, things they had sitting out there and I was like, that's really pretty. I'm going to buy one of those. Yeah, nurses are not my, my thing. But that's actually an interesting topic. Um, what happened to all the dubs of hentai? Like, why was that a thing back in the day and why is it not a thing now? Yep, this is the one holdout. My, my library is my one holdout in terms of possessions. For now. I will probably at some point in the next few months start culling, da culling down, culling out a lot of the, uh, the material here. Uh, not the manga. I mean, the, the manga... So, I, I have four bookcases of manga, and it's just... The problem is, if I get rid of the manga and I ever want to read it again, it's really hard to find. Like, just, I kind of have to collect manga so that I can actually access it in future. Otherwise, it becomes, you know, $100 per volume. Hentai manga with Shakespeare in English. Nice. Um, are there any particular genres that are so sorely underrepresented or poorly executed in modern-day anime? Yeah, I think um, space opera, we don't get enough of these days. Like, giant fleets of ships kind of anime. That's just kind of died out, sadly. Um... And I know somebody's going to bring up uh, Legend of the Galactic Heroes, but um, that's you know again, that started a long time ago. It's not really a new show. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I, I you know I love to see more space opera. Um, also, similarly, um, actually, so that's not quite space opera. That's more like I guess when I'm th talking about that, that is more like the military science fiction, the, the, the big epic military science fiction. I also would love to see more. Um, you know, over-the-top space opera, kind of like Star Wars, or, yeah, you know, like Space Dandy, although Space Dandy is just so misogynistic, I just couldn't handle it. Um, but, I you mean, know, that kind of stuff, that, that kind of, you know, big spaceships and laser guns kind of stuff. I, I mean, I, I think Space Dandy is technically science fiction, it's just very light science fiction. Right? It is, uh, it is goofy science fiction. Didn't know that, Wolfried. That's cool. Is Legend of the Galactic Heroes out in the West yet? Has, um... I think Nozomi licensed it, right? Have they, have they started releasing Galactic Heroes on DVD yet? Over here? I'm not sure. Because if so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a try. Let me pull this. Do I have a college major? Yes. I am a computer science major. I got my bachelor's in computer science some 20 years ago. 
Oh, Sentai has Legend of Gladiator Heroes. Okay, fair enough. The Otaku Coin. I'm not familiar with that. Is that a um, cryptocurrency? What's the Otaku Coin? But yes, I'm, I'm a programmer, and I've been a programmer... Um, no, that's not quite true. Um, most of my career, I, I've been a software developer of some stripe or other. Uh, I've also bounced into other adjacent careers, but I've, I've always kind of ended up back in programming. The novels have been released here. Okay, fair enough. How old am I? 41. Oh, they're putting on High Dive. Okay, that makes sense. So it's on their streaming service. That makes a lot of sense. Instead of trying to release, you know, 100 DVDs. Okay, cool. I will, I will check it out on High Dive then. <laughs> Thanks, Underdog. I've been around a long time, so I've, I've, I've built up knowledge. I wish I was as smart as I want to be. Put it that way. I do dumb stuff all the time. Yeah, computer scientist. Imagine that. Not too surprising. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't say I'd watch all of Legend of the Galactic Heroes. I said I'd check it out. <laughs> mm. But yeah, and to that point, I mean, you know, and, and, and thank you for that, that comment, Underdog. Um, the vast majority of this just comes from absorbing large amounts of material and then thinking about it. Interesting. I'll have to look up, look, look up that um, otaku coin. I actually, like, I, I own a fair number of different uh, cryptocurrencies. That's a, a hobby of mine. We actually are involved with that at work, too. So, interesting. Not sure if that's the best application of crypto cryptocurrencies, but it's interesting. I'll, I'll always, you know, push into that. PhD in computer science. Man, good luck, Jod. That's, that's a hard road. I stopped after um, my, my bachelor's. Just because it's hard to... Yeah, at least in my area, in my environment, uh, the expense of a, a master's or PhD is outweighed by the effectiveness of that helping with your career you know you end up making more money with experience anyway instead of having the, the better the better um uh the better degree so it's just not not valuable but yeah everyone loves legend of the galactic heroes unfortunately it's been so hyped for me now i fear that i'm going to watch it and be disappointed you want to teach yeah yeah i, I teach computer science like locally with uh, adult ed classes um, so it's you know, relatively informal. You just have to know what you're talking about. You don't need a, a higher level degree. Well, that's a shame. Well, I hope you get involved in actual application, Jod, because uh, I, I would hate to imagine um, professors teaching students without having actual application of, uh, of that. I read the manga called How I Stalk Some Dude with an Exposed... I have not read that, but I'm curious. Is that available, like, legitimately? Or is that, uh... Is that out there? Is, is that, uh... Scanlated? I believe that's a real title. I totally believe that. I did... I have read, um... How to Build a Dungeon, Remonster, and the time I got, um... Uh, reincarnated as, as a slime. Those are all cool. Oh, Gact is getting into it. I'm... I'm interested. Gact has a good head on his shoulders. Huh. How many mech anime have I watched? A couple dozen, probably. Pretty much all the Gundams. Um... Let's see here. Macross, Macross 7, Macross 0, Macross Plus, Macross Frontier. Um... Let's see here. Um, Infinite Revias... Uh, we're talking watch to completion. Um, Voltron, Ideon, Zambot 3, um, others watch to completion. I mean, again, I watched Eva beginning and end. Let's see what else. Oh, Full Metal Panic. 
Full Metal Fuu and Second Raid. Although, actually, I haven't, I haven't finished the original Full Metal, Full Metal Panic. Um, let's see here. Um, other stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Gak's a huge Gundam fan. He's really cool. Um, am I afraid that such characters with infinite scalability are hard to write and balance? Yes, they are. Characters with infinite scalability are just are innately hard to write and balance. Limitations create interesting characters, in general. Um, do I prefer real robot or super robot? Real. I'm a real fan. Super robot is fun, but it's it tends to be not derivative, but it, um, it tends to be the same thing over and over again. You know, it, it's hard to tell really interesting stories in a super robot story because the the mecha is almost by definition capable of kind of ridiculous powers where you can just kind of invent a new power for this episode so <laughs> we'll talk about 65 words long that's funny so super robot series are, are shows where the mecha is not treated as like a um um like a real piece of industrial machinery it is essentially a an artifact it's a a thing that somebody invented and, but if it gets beat up, like it gets repaired in the next episode, um, you know, there, there's there are no engineers crawling all over it, and no repair personnel crawling all over it, you know. So you think Gigantor, you think um, Mazinger Z, you think the, those sorts of things, where there is no uh, no attention paid to the realism of actually maintaining a three story tall robot, um, whereas real robot is you know is more realistic. Oh, interesting. Gact is in uh, Final Fantasy VII. That's cool. Or a plot thread in Final Fantasy VII. That's cool. Um, yeah, Brave. I watched a few... I, I watched a bit of um, Gal Gygar back in the day. And I think some of uh, Jay Decker, actually, as well. Not a lot of it, but... Yeah, Gurren Lagann's a, a classic super robot show. Um, but yeah, no, Gact is cool. Um, there's a great clip online on YouTube somewhere of Gact on a talk show where he is quoting uh, various characters from the original Gundam series, like, in character, and doing famous lines from Gundam, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I've read a few, a few volumes of, of Hollick. I really liked Hollick. Again, it, 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 um, uh, the, the callbacks to other Clamp series uh, kind of caught me off guard because I was like, is this important? Um, and so I got, how much of Holic do I have? Um, oh, do I still have any Holic? I may have sold my Holic. I'm not seeing it. Apparently I did. Um, but yeah, I read a few volumes of Holic and, and, um, I really like the, the whole storyline of, of Holic, the whole, the whole theme, that, that's sort of, again, sort of Twilight Zone-esque feel of, of Holic. Bittersweet ending, okay. Good, good to know. I'm, I may get back into it. Um, I have not watched Gun and Sword. Or Gun X Sword. Yeah, the Zeta Gundam movies by, by Gact. The, the, uh, no, the, the, the song Gact wrote and performed for the Zeta Gundam movies. And if, if you check out the uh, his music video for that song for the Zeta Gundam movies, like it's him in a normal suit in a, you know, in a Gundam, um, um, Frame, so he, he's in a a, um, a cockpit of a Gundam, basically singing the song. It's it's really awesome, totally Gundam themed, uh, for that, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, so I can talk about it. Uh, yes, so the anime I'm, I'm referring to, oh gosh, now I can't remember the name of it. Um, oh, this is annoying. Um. There's uh, an old fantasy series called uh, Gore, G-O-R, by John Norman, which is a pen name. Um, it's in one of those, these uh, creepy fantasy worlds where, you know, um, girls get enslaved and collared and um, guys are these big muscle barbarians who, you know, lead uh, collared slave girls around by chains. Uh, it's one of those sorts of things where it's like, you've got issues. Um, and this hentai, it's like a five episode hentai series, is clearly set in gore just with kind of the serial numbers filed off. Um, and gosh, it's annoying me that I can't remember the name of it. Um, it is, gosh, um, like Legend of Something, 
um, or it, it's you know something of something. It, it's, a, it's a multi-word title, and so it's yeah, it's this world where you know girls can get enslaved, and then they're basically sex slaves to to hunky guys, um, and uh, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, it has a decent production budget. It was clearly made in like the eighties, um, and like there's like uh, everyone rides like these sort of chocobo style creatures. Um, there's a fair amount of thought given into the world and the politics. And it, like there's political stuff that happens, all that stuff. Um, it's really, really weird. And a if you ever watch it and you ever watch the English dub, you will recognize the voice of the main male character. He is a well-known anime voice actor to this day. It's it's bizarre. Um, and the reason I watched it is because I, I heard of this connection. I was like, I this it, really? I gotta see this. So I went and, and you know and found it. But yeah, it's really weird. Um, heard read the fan manga clamp made of JoJo. I have not read that. No. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good way of putting it. Uh, Cruz Super Robot is heroic. Real, ro real robot is more militaristic, usually. How do I decide the next anime you want to watch? Do I follow a list in order, or do you just go by gut feeling, um, what feel like seeing next on that list? Uh, I generally go with gut feeling. I'm pretty simplistic with that, where I'm just like, I want to watch that. And as I said before, I think, sometimes I'll just go on Crunchyroll and just look for something that looks interesting. Like, I'll, I'll sort by alphabetic, pick a random letter, scroll down until I find something that looks neat, and just watch the first episode and just see if I like it or not. So I'll, I'll be very random at times. Uh, the plan for 2017, I will show you. 2018! So basically, I went through my anime collection, my DVD collection, and I was like, um, I got all this anime I haven't seen yet, but I actually spent money on. I should probably watch some of them. So I put together this list of if you can see any of that, of anime series that I own, that I want to watch, and I had a difficult time figuring out in what order I was going to watch them, so I ended up putting them in chronological order. So I'm, going to, I'm watching these in the order in which they were originally, originally released in Japan. That is the plan for 2018 for these series. So that's what's going on. Glad to hear that, Jode. Yep, notepad. Actually, um, text edit on the Mac. But same idea. So yeah, I'm going to be going through these and watching these. That is the plan. Um, I am also investigating doing another Serial Experiments Lane series this year, by the way. Um, I want to dig into Lane in more detail and, and make some videos about a lot of the elements in Lane that folks, I think, aren't talking about, which is strange. Um, do 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 Thanks for subscribing. But, uh, yeah, and so for me, going through it chronologically is interesting because I can actually, I can see the progression of anime as a medium as I'm going through these shows. Um, obviously, there'll be some times where I'm like, I want to skip forward or back, and that's fine. Like, you don't have to follow the list exactly. But I think this is a, a good start. Yeah, that's one of the problems, actually, is that um, I have air... Then Ergo Proxy, then then Canon, then Clanad. Oh boy. Um, let's see here. Do, do, do. You heard Brain Powered was bad. I watched the first disc of Brain Powered and it was not bad. It absolutely throws you into the middle of a very complex plot and doesn't explain any of it. And there are all these characters with all these complex relationships with each other. This guy hates that person, and this person is kind of interested in that person, and you have no idea why. Um, anime often starts in media res. Brain power takes that to an extreme. So I found it interesting and enjoyable once I got, once I realized that. But I totally understand why a lot of folks were turned off by brain power. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that, um, and, and we'll, I'll give it a try. And it's, it's definitely an interesting show. Do 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 do. Um, yeah, and you got the, uh, the whole upload schedule, you know, issue. I, you know, I cannot commit to an upload schedule. I'll, I'll review something every week, but then I have a backlog of stuff I've watched. What about Hibernate Renme? I could do Hibernate Renme, but people are clamoring for more lane material. 
they're not really talking about Hibernate, strangely. Um, listen to J-Rock. Cool. Didn't understand the, uh, the ending of Ego Proxy. I have not heard of a Blu-ray release of Infinite Rebias with an English dub. I, I, it may have happened, but I have not heard of that. Yeah, yeah, Tomino loves throwing you into, a, uh, into something without explaining it, but this is... You know, this is the worst of that that I've ever seen him do. At worst as in most extreme, most, most strong version of that. Uh, I mean, King Gaynor, yeah, there's a lot going on. I love King Gaynor. Um, but you can tease out what's going on and people explain things. And isn't there some stuff in there where some, some, there's some narration, I think, in King Gaynor explaining stuff. Not in brain powered. You just have to figure it out as you go along. You yearn for having a Renme. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to talk about having a Renme uh, more too. I, I could do that. But, you know, um, th there's oddly very little analysis of lane online and there's very little going into detail about lane uh and there's a lot to talk about there's there's a, a lot of symbolism there's a lot of uh references they just don't do that the correct, the correct order to, to, yeah the correct order to watch tenchi moyo in my opinion is chronological start with what's released first the first tenchi ova and go on from there um i think mean, that's how you move forward and pretty much everything is chronological. In, in other words, they don't usually do prequels in the Tenchi. I, think, I don't think they've ever done a prequel in the Tenchi franchise. Um, now, a lot of the, the stuff is basically in different universes, different timelines. So they'll kind of branch off from there. But they generally move on from there. Um, yeah, the, the, the films generally follow the first TV series. I mean, I think they've said Tenchi Forever is... Oh no, I think Daughter of Darkness, they said, was technically the first but you can find things that don't quite match up with the tv chronology um so tenchi is technically a harem anime but being the first harem anime it doesn't really follow a lot of the, the traditions that were established in later um stories oh is it uh, yes it is a it is a harem romance space opera it is all of those things um it, and it does actually manage to juggle all of those genres all at once uh, quite impressive. One of the reasons I love the Tenchi franchise is because it does fire on many cylinders all at once. Um, so yeah. Should you watch Kenshin Whole? So here's the thing. Um, there are three seasons of Kenshin TV. Uh, the first two are pretty much straight from the manga. The, f the third is entirely filler. Almost entirely filler. So, you know, absolutely watch the first two, but if you go to the season three, realize you're going to get basically no extra story out of that. Uh, and apparently it's pretty, it's pretty silly. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, and the manga is arguably the, the, the better structured story, just because of, you know, the pressures on anime are different. So. <clears throat> well, I mean, Cruz, technically it's all canon. Right. The TV is just as canon as the OVA. Um, they're just different canons. They're, they're, they're different timelines within that franchise. Which is weird. But it's, it's just, it's, it's the way that works. And the reason I say, the reason I say that is because I, is because of um, Keone. You know, if, if you stick to the, OV, to the original OVA timeline, you never get Keone. Like the TV Keone. And I think she, she is such an important character to the the um, the balance of all those characters. I, I think she really counterbalances a lot of the other the other stuff in that, especially Mahoshi, where Mahoshi just kind of feels like a weird outlier when it's just Mahoshi, but with Kione there, th that really fits better, I think. Um, so, uh, Tenchi Moyo in Love is not a pre well, so Tenchi Moyo in Love involves time travel back to the past. So in that sense, yes, it is a prequel, but it starts in the modern day, you know, in the timeline, but then they, 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 they travel back and past. So, like, Disney buying Star Wars and making things non-canon, then can that really happen? Technically, yeah. Um, my personal definition of canon. My personal definition of canon is, do the owners of the thing consider it part of their story? You know, part of their timeline. 
If they say yes, then yes. I mean, there's head cannon. You know, you can consider whatever you want cannon, but ultimately the the authority has to rest in someone somewhere, and for me that has to be the you know the creator or the holder of the rights or you know however you you define that. Um. Yeah, and again, it gets complicated. And, and Tenji is a great example of complication because you have Kajishima, who's the original creator of Tenji, and he's doing the you know, his timeline. Then you have the TV series and other things are in their own timeline. But the, those TV series are owned by AIC, who you know owns the well, partially owns all those things. So it's kind of like, well, who is the, you know, who is the owner of this? Who's the creator of this? It's lots of different people. It's complicated. Um. And, that's, and it's one of the reasons why I'm not as freaked out about what is canon or non-canon. I, I think you have to be restrictive about what is technically canon, right? But if you want to decide that something is different in your own head, great, go for it. That's fine. Um, so the creator of Kenshin um, was arrested on charges of owning um, multiple DVDs of... Uh, of young teenage girls in the nude. So, um, and he, he admitted to this. Um, and, uh, make of that what you will. So that's interesting, Bruno. Um, see, in, in my view, in the OVA, the characters sit and bicker much less than they do in the TV series. Like, to me, sitting and bickering is, is more a Tenchi Universe, Tenchi in Tokyo thing. And it is in the OVAs, where in the OVAs, generally, there's more stuff happening. Um, but it's been a while since I see it, since, since I saw it. So, that may be uh, rose-tinted glasses. There's certainly a lot of bickering in Tenchi in Tokyo, but Tenchi in Tokyo is not exactly the high point of, uh, of the Tenchi franchise. Shin Tenchi Moyo. But yeah, the, 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 well, well put, Joe. The work is independent of the virtues of the creator. You know, whatever, you know, um, I mean, uh, Orson Welles could be a jerk. That does not make Citizen Kane a bad film. How many languages do I speak? Right now, just one. English. Um... I, I know enough Japanese to uh, get around in Japan if I need to, but I am by no means even basically fluent in the language. You know, I, I know a handful of basic words, and I can speak a handful of basic words. And I've been exposed to enough Japanese, both in anime and in live-action Japanese works, that I can pronounce Japanese clearly enough to be understood by the average Japanese person. Um, but that's that's as far as it goes. Um, I've learned a little bit of Spanish, like to I like to expand that a little bit, and I took uh, Francais as my main language back in high school and college. So I've done a little bit of a uh, um, little bit, little bit of Francais, and fortunately I can um, I can parler Francais decently, but I, I know very very little of the language now. Have I seen OVA four of Tenchi? Which one is that? Is OVA 4, is that the one from a couple of years ago? Because yes. Let's see here. Um, yeah, I agree. The, 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 the Jiraiyan ships were a really neat design. That's really cool. Um, uh, I think it's one of the reasons that, that, that really, one of the things that really attracted me to the Tenchi franchise is those those wooden ships and the whole idea of trees as objects of power. Um, I grew up in the woods. Uh, well, on a wooded lot. I mean, it was a, it was a subdivision, uh, you know, in a neighborhood, but uh, there were trees all over the place. So I think that, that touched me, right, in a good way. So... Well, that's the thing. I, I, I guess I guess the issue I had with the TV series is that while there's always something new happening, a lot of it is filler. A lot of it is just a, a new thing for the for the um, just because they, they needed a new thing to happen. 
but it didn't really reveal much to me personally. Yep, I grew up in the woods. Um, basically, they, so they were wooded lots that people built houses on, but everyone had like two, three, four acres of woods, and then like a house in the you know, on that land. So there were there were always you know there were, there were it wasn't like out in the woods where like you know the next, next house is fifty miles away. Like it was in a neighborhood, but it was just woods everywhere. So that was really cool. I uh, wolves are probably my spirit animal. Like if, if I had a spirit animal, it would probably be a wolf. I actually at a Renaissance festival, I got one of those uh, you know medallions on a chain, and it was a moon on one side and a wolf on the other. I still have it here somewhere. Um, oh, cool! I have not seen OVA four. Interesting. I was not aware that there was an OV, a Tenchi OVA four. My bad. I will have to check that out. Yeah, the latest Tenchi se thing I've seen was well, that, that Tenchi TV series, the five episodes. Ten um, I Tenchi Moyo was the latest thing I saw, and before that, War on Geminar. Which was surprisingly entertaining. Like there's, there's, and there's surprisingly, I don't want to say complex, but there, there's a, there's more going on in that OVA than I expected. Like they, they, they hit some interesting themes, and interesting plot points. Um, you know, more than a Tenchi series needs to, but going back to kind of that classic tone and feel, which is cool. You ever Digimon not series? Um. Yeah, man. Gotta be. Don't like how round Tenchi's face is. Fair enough. How do I deal with the mean comments in my videos? Delete. Pretty much. If I see them, I delete them. Um, you know, what do you do? I've, I've, I've been on YouTube for, what, eight years now? So I'm just, I'm used to the fact that some people like to troll. Um, it hurts. I mean, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't bounce right off me, but I'm used to it. Yep, clip that one. Clip that. But yeah, I mean, it, it, and for what it's worth, Bruno, I, I, I totally empathize that the Tenchi, especially the Tenchi OVA art style is very distinctive. It's, it's definitely different. Um, it's different, uh. Um, Story-wise, or it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a distinctive style. Yeah, challenge the fisticuffs exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> Spaghetti noodles at dawn, sir. Well, you're right. Trolling and mean comments are the same thing. Um, I generally tend to believe that mean comments are a are a form of trolling, where I, I think. You know, a lot of that, you know, you suck and you should die and how dare you and all that is probably, you know, intending for a strong reaction. You know, they want to engage, which I think is probably, um, you know, again, a form of trolling in the sense that the person is trying to call you out. Um, but you're right, there are, are different things. But, yeah, and I mean, Warren Geminar has connections back to Duel Parallel Trouble Adventure. Which is good to see Duel getting woven back into the franchise. I thought that was a... Duel introduced some, some interesting things to the, to the universe. It was good to see Warren Geminar um, work those in and then delve into them further. Well, the reason you haven't seen a lot of mean comments, Fisher, is that when I see them, I delete them. Um, I have been... Um, and I... I think the past year or so, I lost track of some comments. I, I didn't wasn't checking that frequently, so there are probably some on there. But for a long time, like I heavily policed my comments and I deleted anyone that were, you know, um, any that were that were mean. So I've definitely I've definitely kept that uh, kept kept the videos as uh, as pleasant as possible because I just you know we 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 ain't got time for that. Right? Why put up with it? Um, have I played Dota 2? Nope, no interest. I suck at, at um, uh, shooters. I'm, I'm no good at shooters. Um, if it's a single player first person shooter that isn't modern, <laughs> I can usually handle it. 
in the sense that you know I'm, but a, a a shooter that requires skill I will suck at and I will not have fun with. Um, Photon the Idiot's Menace. Oh, or the Idiot Menace. I was so looking forward to that OVA, and I watched it and I was so disappointed. <coughs> the most accurate review I read of Photon said. The last episode is an hour, and it feels like an eternity. It was so true. Oh. Don't use an R RP RTS. Okay. Fair enough. This is the most beautiful TV series I've seen. <sighs> Again, it depends. Because beauty, I mean, um, there are things that are beautiful in different ways. Where just, you know, there's different artistic approaches to the... To, to the, the, the thing, but what leaps, leaps to mind, honestly, is Land of the Lustrous from this past season. It was just consistently gorgeous. And again, it's CGI. Well, the backgrounds are painted. Oh, Dota 2 is MOBA. Okay, sorry. Um, never mind. I mean, Escaflone is certainly a remarkable, amazing show. Um... Visually and artistically and so forth. What appeals to me? What what appeals to me in in what in in what what uh, what mediums? My favorite movie, TV show, anime. I don't have favorites. I really, honestly, don't. Uh, used to be Serial Experiments Lane, but I like other things better in, in different ways. You know, Lane for me is the most intricate anime TV series I've seen in terms of themes, symbolism, and all those things all coming together while also having a lot of subtle references that you have to piece together where you can understand a lot of lane that they don't tell you, you just have to be paying very close attention. Um, but that doesn't make it, you know, there are other shows that I just plain enjoy watching more than Lane, because Lane is, is a, a head sink. You know, there's a lot to think about with Lane. So, it really depends. Ah! Wish we had a version of the Escalade TV series that had the art of the film. I have not seen the film. Um, I've seen, like, the trailer for it, but I totally agree. No, well, um, I have favorite Pokemons. I don't, I don't have favorite TV series, movies, OVAs, books, things like that. I don't have favorite media. But there, there are certainly, you know, characters that I like more than others. In some cases. Do I enjoy Locked Room Mysteries? Yes. Um, I read a lot of mysteries as a kid. Big fan of Agatha Christie. Stuff like that. Um, I, I, I don't and I haven't done the sort of locked room, the physical locked room puzzle things where, like, you are physically in the room, but... <laughs> I've not seen Breaking Bad. I have not seen a single minute of Breaking Bad. Again, one of those things I just haven't gotten to yet. Um, I have not played The Witcher. I, I have bought with the, Witcher, with the Witcher 3, and it is sitting on my PlayStation 4 right now as part of my backlog to, to play someday. But again, i got to finish Nier first. I'll probably do Nier, and I might do Final Fantasy 15. We'll see. I just want to make some progress in, in uh, Skyrim. So folks asked, in Skyrim I'm playing basically a fighter. Um, and I'm more or less balancing a you know, melee fighter. And I'm more or less balancing that with some spell stuff. Yeah, I want to watch the Agatha Christie anime one of these days too. Um, I have no experience with the 2016 dub, so I, I cannot answer that. I don't know. Um... Having, I mean, I remember the, the the old English dub being perfectly serviceable. Like, I had no problems with it. But it's been a while. Um, so, yeah. I I think Escaflone is one of those things where you could probably go either way. You could go sub, you could go dub, you could go old dub, new dub. Um, but definitely dig into, into the, the new dub and what folks think about it. But, yeah. Incredible German dub. That's cool. Have I seen Hunter Hunter 2011? Nope. Shonen. I did watch, I think, the first episode. Like, eh. 
yeah, there's an Agatha Christie anime. It's um, Poirot and Miss Marple as anime characters. It's awesome. It's like 10 years old, 15 years old, something like that. I seen like the first episode. Yeah, The Witcher, unfortunately, Witcher 1 and 2 and really 3 came out when I was still out of video games. But now that I'm back into it, I might, you know, I will, I will check them out. Uh, there are probably a few of those, these video games where I will end up watch. I will end up playing some of them, but I will not finish them. Like Witcher being a good example, where like, um, I may or may not finish The Witcher, but I feel like I should play it. Same with some of these Final Fantasy games, where I played some Final Fantasy games, but I don't think I finished any of them. That's okay. Do I listen to Western classical music? A little. Um, um, I don't really listen to music much, period. Like, I don't sit around with music on, because I find it distracting. So, um, but class, Western classical music is one of my favorite, uh, um, I said favorite. Um, Western classical music is one of the, one of the uh, styles of music that I collected most of. So my collection has a lot of, J, uh, a lot of um, anime music, a lot of classical music, a little jazz variety. But a lot of anime music. A lot of anime music, I will, I will admit. That is, that is my thing. Um, because a lot of it is instrumental. So that's the thing. I'm, I love instrumental music. I don't really care for music with lyrics. As a very, very broad rule. I, in other words, given a choice, I would generally listen to instrumental music as opposed to music with, with lyrics. Uh, there's some, obviously, a lot of amazing music with lyrics, but that's kind of my, my thing. Yeah, that's nice. Is that, I, 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 and I, th I think that's what I got. Is that the Witcher 3 complete version? Um, I've never seen Fallout. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm tempted by Yakuza. I will probably get one of the Yakuza games at some point. I've heard some very good things about Yakuza. So that is... Um, that is intriguing to me. I'm curious when... I'm, I'm, I'll be curious how they handle the... the content of being a Yakuza. Right, like that is something that is very hard to, to. If the game does not treat that with the gravitas it deserves, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna, I, I can sense I'm gonna have some issues with that. Like to me, it's it's hard to, you know, because I, I know a lot of the, the wackiness of the Yakuza series, uh, and I, I know that the the Yakuza storyline is not that wacky, but it's one of those, you know. Um, it better not be slightly less wacky than the rest of the game, right? So we'll see. But also the advantage, and one of, I, I'm, I'm kind of waiting a, a, a little bit too because I'm, I'm hoping they will, get, they will get cheaper. I'll be able to pick up a, one of these Yakuza games inexpensively and try it out that way. Glad you could be here, Joad. Hope you can join us for some more streams. I'm here every Friday. Um... Brazil had an Evangelion dub in the ni late 90s. Cool. Hope to talk to you again as well, Joe. Um, but then Animax aired it in the mid-aughts. It was redubbed entirely. There was a second English dub of Rurouni Kenshin done for Animax, if I recall. Um, like, some of the episodes. I don't know. Ah, so Fisher asks the question. Have I seen the Ancient Majesty's Bride? Am I familiar with the Ancient Majesty's Bride? Yeah, I'm fairly familiar with the Ancient Majesty's Bride. <laughs> I've seen up through, I think, episode 8 of the, the series. The holidays have gotten me backlogged uh, with, uh, with, with anime, but I, probably this weekend, I'm hoping, uh, or I'll put it this way, I'm setting aside some time this weekend that hopefully will not get pushed by other things to catch up on Ancient Majesty's Bride. Um, I'm loving that show. Um, I'm a little hesitant to watch more of it because at this point it is just a straight adaptation of the manga. So I'm, I'm kind of like, okay, yeah, that happened. Yeah, that happened. Like, it's just, it's, it's, it's very well done, but I feel like I'm just re-watching something I've already experienced. So that's, that's, that's the only reason I'm not, you know, 
um, watching it um, obsessively. Ah, good question, Bruno. Um, so here's the thing. Um, the OVA... So... Very... So this is kind of a spoiler for episode one, which I, I think is, is reasonable. Um, Chise is a girl who is sensitive to the existence of spirits and magic and so forth and so on. And this has led to her having a very traumatized childhood. Because she sees all these things other people can't see and she's very scared of them. And everyone's like, why are you scared? There's nothing there. Um, and it's caused a lot of problems for her. To the point that she... <clears throat> she sells herself to a... Um, like at auction to a group of magical beings. Um, with the full knowledge that she might end up, end up being kind of experimented on, but she, because she is so tired of being threatened by all of these creatures, it's kind of like, you know, I, I would rather be around somebody who at least knows how to deal with these things, even if it's not necessarily the most pleasant future for me. Um, as a result, for much of this, for much of the TV series, she's very passive and very much still getting used to being around people who, like, care for her, um, until around episode 7, if I recall. Um, and she starts to slowly kind of come out of that shell. The OVA starts later, chronologically, once she is sort of more healed, and then flashes back to her earlier experiences in, in her childhood and so forth. So if you don't get until, like, I haven't seen any of that, any of that flashback stuff, well, a little bit of it in the TV series. So... I know people, I know somebody in particular, who um, said, if I had started with the TV series, I would have found Chise so, you know, passive and traumatized, I probably wouldn't have watched it. But having started with the OVA and realizing, oh, okay, here's where she goes, I was more willing to, to deal with it. So that's the, the, you know, the drawback. With the OVA, you are going to, it's, it is going to kind of, it, yeah, it will kind of spoil some of the reveal of her backstory and what she went through, you know, in specific details. But that might be the best way to experience the character. Alright. Um, it's not so much Stockholm Syndrome as, um... Imagine if you can constantly see... Imagine if every tenth person you meet is actually a serial killer, and you're the only one who knows it. And so you see people on the street, and you're like, oh, go oh, uh, uh, uh. And everyone's like, what? What's your deal? Right? And you're looking at them thinking, in, you know, you're imagining all the things they've done, and that's how you've lived for the past 15 years of your life. That's been her experience. And then, it's not a spoiler, because it's clear from the, from the show, um, once she's taken in, she is, um, you know, she has a much more stable, much more, you know, um, uh, loving experience. You know, they obviously care for her. Um, so she starts to kind of break out of that shell. That's it. Thanks for joining us, Bruno. Is anime my preferred form of entertainment? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, I've certainly watched more anime than any other form of entertainment at this point, I'd say. Uh, certainly, you know, more than I've watched Hollywood movies. Although, I, I mean... I've seen a fair amount of Western entertainment. I've read a fair amount of Western entertainment. But... My preferred form of entertainment for the past year or two has actually been Mystery Science Theater 3000. Like, when I am tired and I want to relax, I will watch an old episode of... Sorry. Mm. When I was a kid, I had this... Uh, this problem in my ears. Uh, and I'm talking like really, really, really young, so that when I, as I was forming my ability to hear and speak English, I was hearing everybody. It was as though I was listening to them from the bottom of a pool. So I heard everything slurred. And as a result, partly because also I have a lot of things to say, I tend to speak really quickly and really slurred. So I apologize. 
I will try to speak more clearly and effectively now. Um, what was I saying? Excuse me. <coughs> there we go. Um, so, yeah. Generally, when I am feeling tired, I'll watch an old episode of Mystery Science Theater 3000. And that is how I relax. But failing that, I watch anime. Unless I'm burned out, right? I mean, there's also the fact that sometimes you watch too much of a thing and you're like, I need a break from this thing. So it depends. But yeah, Fisher, same, same basic magical concept, but much darker, if you will. Um, so that's an, an interesting thing. Okay, I've been going for two and a half hours tonight. So, speaking of being tired, I think I'm going to stop here for the night. Um... <clears throat>